big brands are having to roast a bit darker to, mm. to keep the consistency and to kind of get rid of those more nuanced notes that give the variance in coffee. Your independents, that's their zone. They can really play with that. They can put on guest coffees. They can talk a lot about the types of coffee that's there and et cetera, et cetera. For those people that are listening, thinking that all sounds positive, I don't know what mm. Lee and Aaron are kind of <laughs> exhaling about. Um, <laughs> there's also a massive quality trap, oh. isn't there? Like we've spoken about it before. And people just get sucked into trying to be too good. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Maple Ford Friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and this is episode three of a five-part series where we're talking about big brands versus independent cafes. And in this episode, Erin is going to tell us what the pros and cons of being an independent brand is. What are your thoughts on that, Erin? Um, okay, so first of all, I just want to make the distinction between an independent brand that's less than, say, five stores uh-huh. And an independent brand that's kind of five to 50, more okay. or less. So because, they're, they're more a commercial kind of brand uh, around yeah, 50 because, stores, right? Yeah. So so a con that kind of affects both of them is they they still, even at those level of 50 odd stores, and we've, we've seen it, they they still rely very heavily on key personnel, on, on right. certain individuals. So um, that can be a pro obviously while they're yep. there but it can also be transformative and, and crippling when they're not um it, whether that's leave or whether that's they actually leave permanently mm. um that can just be that can be hugely daunting and you you think that a store that uh, a brand that's got 50 stores that they've made it and they're, they're flourishing and, and they are to an extent but mm. you only need a changeover of like two or three key players and that business is just transformed and um, because you still at that level you still have a lot of staff loyalty to to certain people and characters mm-hmm. rather than to a, a brand and being part of a much bigger entity like like a starbucks for example um so yeah they're a pro and a con um key personnel who can be amazingly inspirational and who can who can really drive a business forward and they can get everyone on board with that culture and what they're trying to do and the vision but also if they're not the owner operator if they're a cmo or they're a coo or whatever it is then them leaving can be catastrophic um and on that quite tricky. on that i worked for a, probably the most foundational specialty coffee shop in sydney about 20 years ago it was about the third year of my career we were not allowed to talk to customers as baristas right. wow and uh i used to get a dressing down for those who don't know what that means i used to get yelled at by the owner we were doing about two thousand espresso based drinks a day wow uh between three baristas and uh i got yelled at regularly because customers would know my name and the, they were we weren't allowed to talk to customers so they weren't hearing they didn't know my name from when I was on shift uh, when as baristas at the time we were like rock stars in our community everybody came to this cafe and so when you walk down the street to get your lunch people would stop you and want to talk to you and ask you your name and do all that kind of stuff and of course they'd come in the next day and they'd be like hi Lee how are you going or can Lee make my coffee and the the owner had the this perspective of I don't want anyone knowing your name. I don't want anyone to have yeah, a relationship with you. Yeah. Exactly. Because you become too important to the business. And on one part, it's you know, we're talking about the pros and cons of independent cafes. On one part, it's I it's genius. Especially you get amazing baristas making incredible coffee and they have their anonymity on the other side of it you end up having your anonymity right like you as a barista can't you're kneecapped at actually doing the part of your job which is hospitality which is a really really important part of the job as a barista but his business model ended up meaning that his company grew they ended up with a few cafes. They ended up with a massive roasting and retail line that ended up in um, in supermarkets everywhere. The brand recognition was incredible. People enjoyed 
the idea that they were coming in and they were getting like fine dining level uh, kind of experiences from these baristas in the cup, right? And the business sold for over $100 million just recently. You know, if you asked me to forecast what was going to happen when you started that story, I would have not ended up at that. A hundred percent. hundred percent. One one of the massive pros of being an independent brand is the service that you can give. Yeah. And the interaction you can give. And it's like, you know, Starbucks, Costa, Dunkin' Donuts, Tim Hortons, if they're writing your name in the cup, well, that's as personal as it gets. And you're relying right. on the the odd person who's in a specific branch who might mm-hmm. have a particular passion for customer service. But as a culture, that that is kind of the box ticked for them in terms of a personal service. Yeah. And an independent brand, their bread and butter is we get to know our customers, we have that interaction with our customers. Right. And what's in the cup is kind of secondary in a way, like people are going in for that um, interaction and that communication that they're not really getting elsewhere. Like mm-hmm. since 2020 and there's been a huge surge of working from home and staying within your community a bit more, people are going out to find those interactions mm-hmm. and the independents can give that to customers in a way that the big brands can't. And I guess this is where it leans into your your point about a few key staff can really create the shift in a company because there was a key manager that came in and turned around and said to the owner, do you know, like I know you've created this whole brand around the way that people, the the way that the baristas are, like the fact that they're quarantined from, there's a clear line, the espresso machines are high enough so that you can just see the top of the barista's head, you know, And, and I know that you've created this except Imagine, imagine if people actually felt the hospitality. He couldn't see. From the way that he communicated, he couldn't, he felt that we were being hospitable. This is the the kind of hospitality he wanted to show. And so when me and one of the other baristas that worked there at the, that era, and it was like that for a good like couple of decades, um, but-, but then when we went back in and we were, the Bruce is like, hey, how are you doing? Like it was like we were almost scared. Like they were going to cop a latte up to the head because that happened yeah. regularly when I was working there. It was it, I felt it was quite an abusive uh, workplace and quite toxic. But this one manager was the one who convinced the owner that we need to shift. And, and the reason I was told the majority of the shifting happened was because no one would, in the next generation of the workforce, no one would come and work. Uh, they would struggle to find a workforce that would work under those strict kind of guidelines. And so I'm a Gen Xer. We are, you know, it's all about working hard and it's all about, you know, yeah, push, 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 push. So we accepted that dysfunctional behavior. Millennials were the ones that started turning around and say, no, we don't do this. And Gen Z, no chance. Yeah, wait for the next one. No <laughs> chance. They'll throw the latte out glass back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Go on. That, that, is in, that is interesting. It's, um, I, I find that... Um, Maybe that person came from hospitality in the hotel sector and they were recognizing that hospitality in the uh, high street sector is very different. It uh-huh. has to be a lot more, not to say hotels aren't personal, but there's an element of stuffiness. Like there's an element of seen but not heard. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and also in the migration of, as you just mentioned, millennials and Gen Z, what those people want from an experience Never mind the staff who are having to be under those conditions, but your actual customer base are wanting something mm. different from that experience as well. They're wanting to get to know the ins and outs about things. Like, mm. um, I'll, I'll never forget a turning point for me it was about um, seven or eight years ago. I was sat in a, in a client's uh, shop and we were chatting about we refurb and we were chatting about what we could do and how we could do it. And I just kind of overheard customer walk up to the counter and say, uh, what, what machine are you using? And then um, what grind is that? And I just, my ears pricked up and I thought, what? That's, yeah, right. I mean, customers that, are getting lamb, smarter. Lamb monop, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and it's great because it keeps, it keeps 
it keeps independence separate from, from the big brands because it gives them that point of difference. As long as they're willing to be sharp with it and as long as they're willing yeah. to be transparent and they're not the kind of independent who are trying to pull the wool over the customer's eyes, which quite frankly, I mean, if you're still trying to do that in 2023, you're, you haven't got long left to survive. Um, <laughs> Um, because of transparency is just the name of the game, right? The moment, yeah, it's like, a buzzword. Want to know, yeah, but people want to know where the product's coming from. They want to know what you're doing. It, it doesn't mean that they're trying to replicate it themselves and steal all your ideas. They just want to be more invested in that process and what's going on in that in that shop. But that, that was a real turning point for yeah. me as well. Well, and... And I think we all know those of us who have spent many, many years working as barista, when somebody comes in and says anything of that, like, uh, you know, that genre of language, like, what, you yeah. know, what are you dialing in this in at? And, you know, what are your in and out numbers? And, you know, what grinders are you using? Uh, that, is that a conical grinder or blah, 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 right? What they're really trying to do is they're virtue signaling to tell you, I'm a coffee person. Yeah. And what I see happen far too often in independent coffee shops is that like baristas get their back up about that kind of behavior. And it's a yeah. real opportunity for you to lean in when somebody is saying to you, like, I want to be one of your people. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it is it's a, a consumer. collaboration. Right? It's, that's the moment yeah. you dive in and you bring that person into what you're doing. Like, yeah, hey, it's amazing. Then, Go on. Yeah, and they also then become permanently part of your family. Oh, 100%. Like if, you know, if someone's there, they, they're almost begging to be one of the crowd. Yes. And if you're giving them the cold shoulder, you're you're saying, "I no, this isn't the place for you." And if you if you start chatting to them and 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 engaging in them, all of a sudden they feel like they are one of the crowd. And yeah, they're yeah. Probably a customer. They're there every for, day, for years, every day, years and years. Yeah. And that that point leads me really nice into another kind of double edged pro from fun, which is quality. Uh-huh. And this is such a minefield, <laughs> right? So. You're a brave a massive, man. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, I, I, I did wonder whether I should even bring it up, to be honest. But, um, it's, it's a huge plus point of independence. They can really push the quality. They can do things with coffee that the big brands can't. I mentioned before that. Um, Friends, World of Coffee Dubai is back in 2024, and I am proud to announce that the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward will be the official podcast partner for World of Coffee Dubai for the second year in a row. The Roasters Village will be a one of a kind destination for all things coffee. As an exhibitor, introduce your artisanal roasts to an international audience and gain valuable insights from their perspective. Visitors, emerge yourself in the celebratory coffee culture experience by sampling exclusive cups poured with passion from cafes worldwide and absorb insights that will elevate your own appreciation of all things coffee. Whether you brew coffee or just love savoring a fine cup, this event gathers the global coffee community under one roof in an amazing city. Join us at World of Coffee Dubai in 2024 at Dubai World Trade Center from the 21st until the 23rd of January. Tickets are available at dubai.worldofcoffee.org or you can contact us on social media for any questions that you might have at mapforward.coffee. Get your tickets now, folks. Come see the podcast being recorded live and we hope to see you in January in Dubai for World of Coffee. Big brands are having to roast a bit darker to, mm. to keep the consistency and to kind of get rid of those more nuanced notes that give the variance in coffee. Your independence, that's their zone. They can really play with that. They can put on guest coffees. They can talk a lot about the types of coffee that's there and et cetera, et cetera. For those people that are listening, thinking that all sounds positive, I don't know what mm. Lee and Erin are kind of <laughs> exhaling about. Um, <laughs> there's also a massive quality trap, oh. isn't there? Like we've spoken about it before and people just get sucked in to trying to be too good. And yeah. that sounds really bad, but there is a, there is a time and a place for brewing. and a price point. Yeah, and a price point. Yeah, there, but there is a, there is a time and a place for brewing the God shot mm-hmm. or the God filter coffee cup, and that place is is Bristol Championships, and it's 
those types of venues. It's not the coffee shop with the queue of people. Um, Where everyone's buying a cappuccino with two sugars. Exactly, yeah. If you're and charging $40 for a coffee, take your time. Yeah. Even if you're charging yeah. $20 for a coffee, take your time. But if you're charging five bucks for a cup of coffee, you need to move that shit along. The problem is, even if you're charging $20, Twenty dollars for a cup of coffee. You're probably spending more than four times the amount of time making that coffee. Yeah. So you're you're not you're not going to be making the money. No. It sounds amazing, but there, there's there's a real quality trap. And and operators who are listening to this and and are able to look at their business and think really subjectively and, yeah. and not get kind of trapped in that. You know, look at it and think, am I I'm making really good coffee, but is it too good? Like, does it have to be to that standard, or could we make some some economies in terms of working process or, or mm-hmm. time spent? How we can deliver that to still have a really bloody good cup of coffee that's much better than the big brands, but it might not get that extra few percent um, and be that much more profitable and efficient. Um, and and there's definitely a place for for that culture of doing the absolute best you can mm. and um, whether you want to do a lot of internal staff competitions and like encouraging staff to go out to those championships and yeah. get really geeky with coffee, that's brilliant. But day to day and and getting customers in and out through the door, you're going to piss a customer off a lot more because yeah. they've had to be waiting for five, ten minutes because the queue's so long than the marginal increase in the quality of your cup of coffee trying Mm. to get that extra few percent and i'd argue that the majority of the quality is being determined by decisions other than the person who's making it you know the quality of your grinders the quality of your roast the quality of the coffee that's being served and the blends the quality of the milk that you're using and the quality of the water that you're using these are decisions that are creating 90 percent of and and the maintenance right this is creating 90 percent of the quality of the coffee and that's not even taking into consideration the labor that's making it. So th- there are a lot of decisions that the owner gets to make that can really help mitigate uh, how much buy-in the person who's making it has at the the quality of the cup. Yeah, mm. I mean, we've I, I can I can tell you a story about um, uh, a specialty coffee shop that I was working with, and I went in and we were talking about water filtration. I'm really glad you mentioned water. Um, mm. and there was the, the coffee was really nice, but it didn't blow me away. And it, mm. there was something not quite right. And I spoke to the owner and I said, look, what are you doing for filtration? Cause it had that, you can tell when water's not, when it's yeah. the water rather than the, the, the yeah. coffee. Right. Um, I said, oh, you know, we're, we're, we're using these magnesium cartridges because adding magnesium back in plus blah, 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 blah clearly had been reading the paper on the relationship between water and coffee. Like, great. Um, magnesium cotches are really expensive. Um, so I said, okay, that doesn't add up. When did you last change it? They didn't was, know that they needed to change it. It was like 18 months ago. And the, and, and the volumetric lifespan on the cartridge was about four months. And it was you do realize that needs to have yeah. been changed. really and then god i love think, our industry <laughs> yeah so you've got these people who really are doing everything to try and do a good job and then 99 percent of the product that you're serving to the customer is water and it's rubbish because there's just that little gap of knowledge of not quite which realizing. makes you dangerous <laughs> yeah yeah just a little bit of knowledge can make you dangerous sometimes right yeah much more than not, not any. <laughs> um, but um, they've, they've also something that's a really good pro for an independent, um, which they should utilize and often don't utilize is they are often a lot more able to be reactive to, to what's going on in the market mm. or what's going on around them than a big brand. You know, if, if a big brand wants to launch a new product, it doesn't happen overnight. And with an independent, it, it kind of almost can. It can. Like, you know, the owner stays up all night, they sort something out and, and they put pull together some marketing and they can be so reactive. Yeah. Um sometimes they're not. And that 
that's a failing of, of the brand, but they they have that opportunity. That mm. is a massive pro of, of being a, a smaller business. What uh, one thing that I do want to, and folks, I know that this episode has gone on a little little longer than normal, but there is something that I do want to talk about before we wrap up this subject, and that's the barrier to entry for opening a business as an yeah. independent. Yeah, yeah. And we can't have an episode on this and not talk about it. What are your yeah, thoughts yeah. on how low the barrier to entry is in our industry, Aaron? Um, dangerously so. Yes. Um, you, you can you could you can take on leases that you know maybe don't even have a premium. Yeah. Set up a a table more or less. You know, really low quality and just chuck a machine on. And more often than not, people are spending a fortune on a machine yeah. and then not much else. And and they're kind of going there with like you just said a little bit of knowledge, but but mm. not enough. And that can be so dangerous. I mean, it's it's the equivalent of they're kind of diagnosing yourself with some rare condition that's only found in the Amazon rainforest or something because you Google yeah. your symptoms and all of a sudden you've got this thing. And it that is a real problem. Um, but the barrier to entry also varies depending on location because there is a bit of a barrier to entry in terms of competing for premier locations or, or right. good quality locations. Yep. And so the barrier to entry in those scenarios are a lot higher and you do have to be of a good quality. We see, we actually, one of our clients came to us because they lost a site against us with another client previously. Right. Um, and so they were like, right, we've got to hire the people who, who beat us on our last site. Um, because landlords are looking for kind of complete brands and complete concepts rather mm. than just Joe blogs who, who just wants to go and open up a, a whatever. If you're in a suburban location or you're out in the sticks and so then then it's a lot more dangerous because you're still gambling a lot of money you know um yeah. uh, when you're when you're setting up on these sites and you're gambling with livelihoods and sometimes people's houses and all sorts and a lot of these uh these uh property developers are looking at coffee brands as a part of their amenities sales package and yeah. so what they do is they'll they'll go to uh you know people who are buying things uh, buying a new apartment of a high rise that's just gone up and they'll say oh you know there's a x brand that everybody in the local community knows about um, and that's a unique selling proposition for a lot of these people it's a part of the amenities that they can offer uh, for people who may be residents there. So it's become quite the thing, which is why a lot of brands get approached once they've established the first coffee shop and it seems to be doing well. They get approached very, very quickly by a lot of these property developers to try yep. and bring them into the fold. And like, we'll give you rent free for a year, et cetera, et cetera, yep. et cetera. There's so many traps involved in that shit, folks. <laughs> so please yeah. be careful. Please yeah. be so careful. That, there is also good news. I mean, good news for real small, small independents. There are yeah. there is a big drive, certainly in the UK and I know in the states as well, to make high streets more boutiquey and more yeah. less uh, the same. So you don't go to a high street in uh, in the states that's the same as one in Spain, right. or, you know. So right. there is that opportunity where landlords are a little bit more open minded because they've got incentives put in place to take on smaller brands that are less globally known. Right. And for those who don't know what the term high street means, it's the same as the main street in the US or the main road in uh, in Australia, just so that if you're not familiar with that nomenclature. Um, <laughs> all right. So we're going to talk in the next episode about who takes better care of the customer. Is it the bigger brands or is it the independent uh, brands and this is I'm sure this is going to be a really interesting conversation so join us for that folks peace love and peanut butter have an amazing rest of your day thanks friends if you enjoyed this video here's what you should check out next consider supporting Mapper Forward on Patreon and be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell before you leave